Let's talk about uh, Israel and Iran. Now, uh, we've been told that Iran has uh, uh, bombed, uh, no, Iran and uh, Israel. Uh, that's a topic we have before us, but I'm being told that uh, we're talking about Oyo State. Okay. The Oyo State Police Command says it has arrested 20 suspected Yoruba nation agitators who invaded the state government secretariat, Agudi, in a battle, the state capital. The state police commissioner, Amzad Adebola, had detailed an investigation and detained you know, persons in that regard. With the deputy of commissioner of police in charge of state criminal investigation department leading the team to unravel the circumstances surrounding the incident. Scores of agitators had earlier on, on Saturday, stormed the secretariat in army camouflage, armed with dangerous weapons and charms. A statement from the command said that 20 suspects had been arrested in possession of three pump-action guns, 291 live cartridges, two expended cartridges, 67 cutlasses, five bulletproof vests, six pairs of boots, and 10 magophone, three Udua-styled Udua beret caps seven bells, 11 Udua Nation Army Camouflage Attire, one unregistered Nissan or Bambos, and three TVS motorcycles. In the meantime, Yoruba Nation campaigner, Sunday Adeyemo, popularly known as Sunday Igbo, has condemned the invasion and dissociated himself from the aggressors. Igbo also restated his stance for non-violent and peaceful negotiation. Well, that's the story. Yes, okay. Okay, we, we have a guest. Um, okay. Um, we now have uh, Professor Jido Fowad Jidibe, who is a professor of international relations and political science Nasarawa State University, Kefi, Nigeria. It joins me now to explore, you know, critical angles to this subject. Well, Professor Adiwe, my friend, good to have you on this day live. Well, I invited you to come and talk first yeah. about the Middle East crisis, not to talk about, uh, yes. you know, crisis in uh, Western Nigeria. So I would rather start with what I invited you for. Now, okay. the Americans, they say they have uh, intervened. Now, as Iran actually taught Israel a lesson, which is what the Iranians are saying. Oh, hello. Yes, I'm with you. Oh, okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure about teaching a lesson. Um, there are something that is a constant in Middle East politics, in the relations among the states, especially Israel and other states like Iran, and uh, especially Iran. And it is that uh, it is about retaliation. The, Israeli, the key drivers of Israeli policy have been preemptive start, strike. If they discover you are developing a capability that will hurt them in future, they attack preemptively to destroy that capability. The other one is a retaliatory response. So each time you, you hurt them, one word or the other, be very certain they will retaliate. And that goes the same with Iran. So it's not about a lesson. On April 1st, Israel, I mean, Israel, mistakenly or not, attacked uh, uh, Damascus, you know, um, a, Syri um, a Syrian site, I mean, I mean uh, that um, killing some, uh, a, a, you know, uh, Revolutionary Guard members. So Iran, everybody knew that Iran, Iran said at that time that they were going to retaliate. And everybody knew they would. So this is a retaliation for that attack that killed some members of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. So it's not about teaching a lesson. In any case, they fired, they were said to have fired about 300 uh, crews and ballistic missiles 
uh, in which Israel said they were able to, uh, you know, forestall and uh, deactivate 99% of them. That actually only one person, one girl, that was hurt and taken to the hospital. And there was a coalition in Israel, uh, uh, Israeli forces, French forces, and uh, UK forces that were said to have provided the technology that led to the interception of those missiles and their neutralization. So I'm not sure it's going to be a lesson, but one thing is constant. If you go by the, the key drivers of Israeli policy in the Middle East, as I said, one is preemptive strike. The other one is retaliatory response. So they are going to now attack preemptively. In other words, they are likely to attack Iran to destroy their capacity to build missiles, to build or destroy missiles, cruise or ballistic. That is certain. When they will do that, we don't know. The other one is retaliatory response. And uh, once you attack their interest, especially from the Middle East area, they are going to attack using what Colin Powell will call overwhelming force. The, 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 when they respond or they retaliate, the retaliation tends to be disproportionate to the original attack. These are certain things that will happen. And already, you can see that the Iranian foreign minister was warning Israel not to retaliate. The world is warning Israel not to retaliate. But something is certain, they will retaliate. That has been their pattern in the relationship in the Middle East since the 1947. Well, but you know, a lot of people have been saying we face the prospect of a third world war. Do you think that that uh, proposition is true, viable, that there could be a third world war on our hands with the escalation of crisis in the Middle East. Now, uh, Iran, or Iran, as Biden calls it, has uh, retaliated. But certainly, that will not be the end of it. What's next? What do you think will be next? Well, I think uh, the expectations of a third world war is uh, over dramatized. Trump, Trump. I don't think it's going Trump, to happen. It's Trump that is Iran. It's Trump. Yeah. It's Trump that is Iran. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, people can say that because of the escalation of the crisis. But one thing you should, the first question you should ask yourself uh, will be who are the friends and foes of the two sides to the conflict? So if you look at the 1967, uh, the first, uh, you know, the 1967 war, the Six Day War, where even, or rather the Yom Kippur War of 1973, where Soviet Union, which was a supporter of, uh, you know, uh, the Arab world, in the, a supporter of uh, uh, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria that attacked, they were not able to stop America and these allies. In fact, within a space of that six day, it, was, it ended quickly. So who are the allies of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Iran? The key allies of uh, allies are Iran, um, Soviet Union, I mean Russia. Russia is bogged in the war with Ukraine. And this capability, this capability to project power onto the global space has been seriously curtailed. There is also India. India has been supporting Iran, not necessarily because of anything, but because it wanted to create a space uh, so that it can reach straight to Afghanistan and Central Asia without going through Pakistan. So they are helping to expand their ports in Southeast Iran. So there is also China in some ways. This China is driven by economic diplomacy. They are not likely to come out. So on the side of the allies, you look at, the, say, Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and Iran are in conflict over who should be, which of the countries is the leader of the Muslim world. Persia is dominantly Shiite. Uh, Saudi Arabia is Sunni. So it, you can't even mobilize pan-Arabism uh, pan or pan-Islamism in the fight against anybody. Then uh, you have support from North Korea. North Korea it has its own problem. It cannot project power on the global space. On the face of it, you see that NATO has been expanding with more members joining in. So it's not going to be easy. I, I, the prospect of uh, any World War III for me is completely ruled out. There will be an escalation in the crisis because Israel for sure is going to attack preemptively to destroy the capability of Iran to deploy future missiles. It is also going to retaliate. That is for certain. We don't know when it will come. There will be an escalation, but somehow 
when once power is disequilibrated in the Middle East, there's also a tendency for them to find a way of bringing it back, back to balance. I think the, the, the fear of a third world war, I mean, it's, uh, it's overstretched. Okay, but what, what is the direct implication of this for the conflict between Israel and Hamas? Because it wasn't just, uh, um, well, it wasn't just uh, Iran attacking Israel. There was also attack from the Hezbollah end. That's why I raised the question about the possibility of a third world war. Well, you know, when the, the, the Arab, if you look at the history of the Arab-Israeli wars, uh, they say, look at the fourth war, the fourth Arab-Israeli war, which we call the Yom Kippur War in 1973. By the, they were still the three countries, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. It lasted 19 days. And within those 19 days, Israel, with the support of US, and despite Soviet support to the other side, within 19 days, they had actually encircled the Egyptian army before the war stopped. This is the longest war. The lesson we are going to learn about this is the changing nature of war. This is the longest war Israel has ever fought in the Middle East. Don't mind, don't forget, fighting the combination of Arab forces, Israel was able to defeat them within six days, within 19 days. Now, Hamas, the population as 2017, was only 590,000 people. And seven, seven months into the war, Israel has not been able to defeat them comprehensively. The same thing you can say about Iran. So we are now coming back to what uh, Karl Claus, we see, you know, a 19th, 19th century uh, Prussian general, called a fog of war. Once you start a war, especially in modern times, you will know, you will know its dynamics. Russia has been boxed. In fact, some people believe that America deliberately tricked Russia into, into the Ukraine war in order to turn it in, its, into its own Vietnam and bog it down and stop the projection of power because under Putin, Russia began again to project power into the global space. We don't know, but what's happening is that uh, we are now going to learn the lesson that you're a big and mighty power does not necessarily mean you will win a war easily. Nobody will have expected that Israel, with all its capabilities and support, seven months into a war with a population of over only 5, 590,000 people, is still struggling. You know, uh, it's, the lesson is that the, the nature of war is changing. The uh, nature of war is changing. Where does this leave some of the allies? For example, Rishi Sunak, who faces an election in the uh, United Kingdom, and also President Biden, who also faces an election. And then what's next for Israel? These are some of the uh, indications. Well, well, remarkably, I'm sure you'll remember that in 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter lost the election because of Iran. You remember the hostage crisis of 1980? We have 52 American hostages who are held and uh, Qatar was unable to release them. This is exactly what probably will happen. What I see, I foresee is that uh, among the Muslims and some young people in the US, the war, the way the US has handled the uh, you know, Israeli attack on, on Hamas, you know, it's, uh, many people are not happy, the young progressive-minded people have been anti-Biden. But now the attack the Iranian attack on Israel, which reminds people of the threats, the existential threat Israel says it faces. Remember all along they say they don't want to recognize the state of Israel, they will drive it into the sea. So those missile attack will also remind people of the existential threat Israel faces and might actually mute the opposition to, you know, to Biden's uh, way of handling it. It is, of course, dicey because there's substantial uh, uh, Muslim population, Muslim and Arab population in the U.S. And, uh, uh, but the young people across, you know, people who are not progressive-minded people who felt or still feel that uh, um, Israel's retaliation has been disproportionate and massive and uh, has led to a number of humanitarian crises. Israel will can now play it up and say, this is exactly what we face. And this is why we want to exterminate uh, Hamas. By the way, I always felt, 
Could it have been a better way for Israel to handle this? I think so. For example, what, what if Israel had insisted that Hamas, I mean, Gaza, not Hamas, G G Hamas and Gaza, they are no different entities, that Gaza should give up the ringleaders of the attack of October 7 that killed 1,200 Israelis and held captured 200 Israelis as hostages. We should not disentangle this because they are related. If Israel had played the card exactly as uh, U.S. did before they attacked uh, Afghanistan in 2021, they would have got more sympathy. On the other hand, the global community that has been condemning Israel, and rightly so, should have also insisted that Gaza should give up the, 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 the ringleaders of the attack of October 7. Remember, U.S. went to war against Afghanistan because Afghanistan, the Taliban's, refused to give up Osama bin Laden. And that was what led to the war. So I think Israel should have made that <coughs> distinction and said, give up the ringleaders and we'll handle them, and there will be no retaliation. But as I said, the, the drivers of their foreign policy in the Middle East, there are two key drivers. One preemptive strike, the other one is retaliatory response. Okay. Once you do, Pro you do me, I do you. This is mosaic law. Professor Atibu, before I let you go, I mean, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, they are excited, of course. So could you speak to the issue of the Palestinian reaction to Iran coming into the conflict and Hezbollah also? Because not many people have been talking about Hezbollah also attacking uh, Israel uh, and how, you know, uh, the people of Gaza have reacted, Hamas to be specific. Palestinians in Gaza. Well, well, there, there has been jubilation in that site because it's an emotional response. And uh, in fact, when the, 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 the Hamas attacked Israel on their on, on their Holy Week and killed one thousand two hundred, there was also a lot of jubilation. But then, where does that lead? Hezbollah, you should understand, they are, you know, they are Shiites. So they, are, they share a lot of commonalities with Iran, and it is expected that they will continue to support. But what is their capability beyond the Middle East? And we can forecast that, you know, um, likely again, Israel is likely to attack again Hezbollah assets in Lebanon. They are trying because they know they supply arms, you know, to uh, Iran. They are likely to go after them. That's what will be part of the preemptive strike to destroy their capability to supply, you know, lethal weapons to Iran. That rejoicing is, you know, tantamount to the what we what we find when there is a military coup and people, you know, troop to the streets to welcome them. But after that euphoria, reality will set in. Reality will set in because Israel will respond. So the the world now for us to say. You know, if we follow Israeli history, it's for war to start thinking of how do we stop Israel? What are they, what will Israel need to be able not to respond? But if you go back to their history, there has never been a time they attacked without responding. Uh, Professor Adibe, on this issue of uh, Israel and uh, Hamas and uh, all the uh, other parties involved, the uh, U.S. Security Council, the uh, International Court of Justice, ICJ. Where are we with global peace? Which would seem to be the uh, major issue in this conversation. So all these U.N. Uh, institutions, well, are they effectual in terms of keeping global peace? You are a professor of international relations. Where are we? Uh, Dr. Bat, you read law. You also know that international law, there continues to be a question. Is even international law law? In the UN system itself, you know the Security Council. There are five powers that wield the veto power. Anything you say about Israel, be sure America will veto it if it's against that. And in this election year, it is suicidal for any candidate to be seen as going against Israel because it's, its power in the Israel is very enormous. So uh, they will, the, UN, the UN said it was going to have a meeting by 4 p.m. their own time. 
And uh, we are still expecting the outcome of the, the War Council meeting, which uh, Netaha, Netanyahu, Netanyahu said it was going to call about what happened. But uh, what are we going to get is the usual condemnation. It is easier in the General Assembly to just morally condemn an action. What is difficult is when it comes to the Security Council, where you have to take a decision that will require some form of enforcement. And because you need the consensus of the five veto-wielding powers, it is difficult to you know, arrive at consensus. China has called for restraint. Russia has called for restraint, and they have sympathy for uh, you know, Iran. US, as Joe Biden has said, look, I, we have ironclad support you know, for, uh, for Israel. By the, I mean, uh, Donald Trump himself has said, look, if I were in power, they, this wouldn't have happened because in an election year, there comes a competition of who is more Israel, who is more pro-Israel among the candidates. So we, we're going to see how it works out. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jido for Adebe, for joining us on this live this Sunday talk show.